Chapter Seven of But Thy Love and Thy Grace by Francis J. Finn, S. J. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Chapter Seven. When Regina reached her room, she lighted the candle and composed herself to make her spiritual reading. For some weeks past, she had been reading The Life of St. Jean Francis de Chantal by the Abbe Bougard. Only the night before she had come upon a pretty story of how Christ had almost literally forced a young girl to love him. She had been led onward by the path of renunciation. When Regina read it, the narrative had appealed to her as being pretty and touching. But now, looking back, it haunted her. She felt in her soul that she had not got out of it all the meaning, that there was, perhaps, in it some message for herself. She turned back a few pages, and again, and with other eyes, read this account of the hard-won spouse of Christ. But of all whom the grace of God snatched from the world, in spite of themselves, none so obstinately resisted at first, or so generously submitted when vanquished, as Marie Marguerite Michel. She belonged to a wealthy family of Franche Comte, and, like many other young girls, her danger lay in her beauty. One night it seemed to her in sleep that a child clothed in white approached and scratched her face, saying, you will now be much more beautiful in the eyes of your spouse. Marie Marguerite awoke, screaming, and insisting that the skin had been torn from her face. Her mother, finding nothing the matter with her face, treated her as a silly dreamer, and bade her go to sleep again. Two days later, Marguerite was attacked by the smallpox, and her face did, indeed, become disfigured. But she still possessed so many means of pleasing the world, and she was still so witty, lively, graceful, so accomplished in every way that she thought not of abandoning her life of pleasure and dissipation one day while resting after a grand ball there suddenly appeared before her the same child that had scratched her face he seemed irritated you are going too far he said i know how to put a stop to the mad extravagance of your youth in taking hold of her feet he crushed them so severely that she screamed aloud shortly after she fell and hurt her foot so seriously that, despite all remedies, she was lame for the rest of her life. On the fourth day after this accident, as she was crying and grieving, the child again appeared, but this time radiant with light. Marguerite was frightened and hid her head under the bed covering. "'I told you,' said the child, smiling, "'that I would succeed in putting a stop to the follies of your youth. Give your heart to God now, since your body is disfigured.' Marguerite tried to obey. It was, in fact, upon the bed of pain, where she lay for six weeks, that she learned to pray, and that her soul began to relish heavenly things. Nature, however, was far from being conquered. One day, in the early part of her convalescence, she chanced to see herself in a mirror. Her disfigured face and crippled figure brought tears to her eyes. At the same instant the child again appeared, holding a veil upon which the figure of Jesus dying was depicted. "'Ah, what is that?' exclaimed Marguerite. "'It is the lover of your soul,' answered the child. "'See to what love has reduced him.' Marguerite's heart was touched by these words, and from that time she loved her deformity, and would not exchange it for all the advantages the world could offer. She went to St. Francis de Sales, resolved to become a religious, but a little embarrassed because her family, opposed to her design, would not give her a dowry. "'Ah, well,' said the saint if you have nothing we want nothing offer these two things to god and go tell mother de chantelle that she may receive you for nothing the holy foundress received her with joy and the saintly bishop himself deigned to give her the habit her novitiate was noted for her sacrifices and her life for the numerous and admirable foundations she conducted saint francis de sales used to say ah how well this cripple walks the cripple, indeed, governed the convent of Belay, de Jean, Vaucelles, and Arone, founded those of Vesincon, Dole, Gray, Salins, and Solaire, arranged the foundations of Freiburg, Plaisance, Milan, and Munich, Bavaria, and if this cripple had lived one year longer, she would have carried the visitation to Canada. The simple girl, as she read these words, failed to make any comparison between herself and the high-born lady, and still, when she laid the book down, there came to her of a sudden the thought that perhaps the diamond ring, which she still strangely loved, was not for her. 
It is all I have left, she murmured to herself, and she gazed upon the twinkling splendor, the only toy that had ever brightened her life. Yet why should I give it up? The door opened slightly, and a voice without was heard to say, May I come in, Regina? The girl started, then recovering herself, arose and answered, Why, certainly, Mrs. Stevens, just look at what I've won. Mrs. Stevens entered. Her pleasant smile brightened the poor room. Oh, isn't it beautiful, she exclaimed, catching Regina's finger. And so you won it, after all. Yes, I was very lucky, wasn't I? Yes, my dear, and I'm so glad you won it. I hope that it will bring a little more joy and pleasure into your life. I often envy you, Mrs. Stevens. You were always so cheerful and light-hearted, and when Rose died you did so much for me without knowing it by your pleasant ways. You was always like sunshine when you came into my room, and— Regina broke off in the middle of her sentence. Mrs. Stevens had suddenly sunk into a chair, and all the sunshine and brightness were gone. Why— why what's the matter for answer mrs stevens began to sob dear dear i didn't say anything to hurt your feelings did i but the sobbing woman wasn't able to make any reply regina waited in distress till the first violent emotion had subsided surely mrs stevens i have said nothing to hurt you have i the woman wiped her eyes and for a few seconds held her handkerchief over her face when she looked up again, she wore her calm, smiling expression as before. "'Excuse me,' she said. "'I'm a bit nervous tonight. Please don't mind what's just happened, Regina. I—I I lost control of myself.' Regina, meanwhile, had been closely scanning the other's features. For the first time, she perceived that Mrs. Stevens' smile was a mask. There were lines of care and suffering upon the cheeks— and an expression almost of agony lurking in the eyes. "'Mrs. Stevens,' she said, putting her arm around the woman's neck, "'please tell me the truth. You have some great trouble.' Mrs. Stevens melted under the kindness. Again her features twitched convulsively. Again she broke into sobs. "'Don't cry, please,' said Regina gently. "'I'm half starved,' said the woman abruptly. "'What?' and my sick son is going into typhoid, I believe, and the older boy is out of work, and the children have eaten the last bite we have. Dear, dear, cried Regina. I spent my last cent today. I'm afraid to call for a doctor. There's nothing coming. Oh, why didn't God take me when he took my husband? Regina, I shall go mad. No, no, don't speak that way, please. When the shops open again in a few weeks, my boy will be working, but it will be too late unless I go bagging. I've pawned everything that will sell. Please take this, said Regina. You can't refuse it, and get your little ones and yourself something to eat. Regina held out a dollar to the woman, who first drank from it, then clutched it, oh, so greedily. The truth of her story was evidenced in the act. God bless you. But it's hard to take it. Good-bye, my dear. When Mrs. Stevens had gone, Regina put on her wraps and hastened down the stairs. She took off the diamond ring in her descent, sighing as she did so. It was hers no longer. End of chapter 7